Good morning, Breakthrough family. We're so glad you joined us. Here are some important things to take note of. Best 2023 applications are now open. We've had an exceptional time during 2022, and we look forward to all God has for us in 2023. Sign up via our website and have a peek at next year's curriculum. Hey, worshippers! If you love expressing your worship through song or instruments, join us for our one-day worship workshop next Saturday, the 29th of October. This is a great opportunity to connect with other worshippers, gain insight into worship dynamics, and lean into God's presence. Register now at breakthroughlife.co.za forward slash events. For catering purposes, registrations close on Tuesday. We have the privilege of hosting We Will Worship for their first Friday's worship event in November. Join us Friday the 4th of November from 7 p.m. as we worship the King of Kings. Attention all high schoolers, we're getting ready to end 2022 with a bang. Join us for Moving On Up, happening from the 1st to the 4th of December. This is a camp about connecting with peers from all over South Africa, cultivating friendships that last, being set ablaze with hope, and spending time in God's presence. Register now at foundationministriesint.com. We are a company of believers hungry for revival in our city, our families, and our nation. Join us for our Revival Night next Sunday, the 30th of October at 6 p.m. for a time of worship and leaning into the presence of God. We have the team from the Collective Church with us, and we look forward to joining in worship with them. Save the date for Sunday, the 4th of December. We're celebrating John and Lisa's 20-year anniversary of being at Breakthrough. This is going to be a great day for the whole family with loads of fun activities and great eats planned. Did you know you can add Breakthrough Life Church as your church on YouVersion's Bible app? It's as easy as scanning this code or searching for Breakthrough Life Church on the app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Breakthrough Life Church, to see us live on Sunday mornings, catch up on sermons, or watch powerful messages from previous conferences. Enjoy the morning with us. Thank you. I love this place more and more. So I think I must get to office here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm very much part of this ministry in, in spirit, in relationship with your pastor John and his dad. I started with his dad. Derek in the mid 80s. Some of you were not born yet. Um, and uh, so when I escape in Gekerk, <laughs> I was trained as a Duomni there for those who don't know. And uh, Derek was actually the, the main influence in my life those years and fathering me and mentoring me in the things of the spirit. And uh, so I really appreciate this ministry and the history, the legacy of, of this house. So thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. I've already uh, been here in the first service, so I did about 20% of my sermon in the first service. <laughs> and uh, so let's try again. Maybe I get to 25%. <laughs> and. Um, my heart is so full of so many things that uh, I want to share with the body of Christ uh, in my calling as a spiritual father. Uh, you know, you, 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 you want to train, teach your people to know everything, to know what God is saying in this time. So my heart is always overflowing and it feels like we don't have enough time to, to get people to mature, to become powerful. Uh, full of God, full of His Spirit, full of the calling God has placed in your life. So um, I will try my best to deposit, and we pray for a heavenly download today, that God is igniting something in your spirit more than you had previously. 
I know some of you are very mature. Some of you are nearly perfect. And, uh, but for the others like me, let's grow. And uh, let's allow God to just edify us, raise us up, and uh, make you powerful and make you dangerous for the enemy. Um, what I want to, part of what I'm doing this morning, is not getting close to all I want. I'm using um, the princi a principle that God has taught me over many years. Um, and the more I'm busy with this, the more I see, the more I understand. So the end result of, of this was, is the book that I've written called The Third Reformation, uh, all about, and I'm using the tabernacle of Moses that eventually became uh, the tabernacle of David and then the temple in Jerusalem and then the second temple in Jerusalem. And now there's no temple in Jerusalem um, because now the temple is supposed to be me and you. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God doesn't dwell in buildings anymore. God doesn't need buildings. He needs people. Uh, and he wants to, to increase his presence in you. Uh, it's all about, about God abiding in us, in you, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, so it's all about this body called the temple of the Holy Spirit to be, have enough room for the fullness of God. And part of what I'm doing today is my, my plea or my uh, word to you to challenge you to allow um, your godly identity to be like God to be like Jesus, to flow in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, to manifest inside of you. So this, this book, based on the tabernacle, is about the three rooms of the tabernacle that was a godly um, blueprint from heaven that Moses spent 40 days on the mountain to get this blueprint from God. And the Bible says there's lots of scriptures on that, and I want to save a little bit of time, so I'm talking faster, so listen quick. Um, but God gave him a blueprint of heaven, how's the presence of God, and how to worship God as in heaven. He gave him a picture of that, and actually says, build this tabernacle according to what I've shown you. So the, the mystery in this is that Moses didn't just build the thing with three rooms because it looks nice. That is exactly the image he got from God from heaven. And actually the Bible says it's a replica of the tabernacle in heaven that he built here. And obviously in heaven everything is spiritual, but he had to, to uh, transform or change or, you know, the spiritual into a physical building. And every thing in a tabernacle, the colors of the ropes, the colors of the material, uh, every furniture, there's two furnitures in every room, everything is about God and how he actually came through Jesus to redeem you and to fill you up with himself. So that's why in the New Testament, it's all about you are now the temple of God. God wants to dwell in you in his fullness. Well, for you, and in, in order for you to understand what it means that, that Jesus lives in me, Holy Spirit lives in me, Father lives in me, you need to understand what he actually came to do in your life. So um, my experience with people over the years Tisa, my wife, and I, we are counseling people, and we are pastors for many years with many people, and uh, daily, weekly, we sit with people trying to help them, heal them, restore them. Um, we are also you know, professional counselors, marriage counselors, uh, but we do far more than that. But you sit with people who are so broken, they messed up everything they touch. Their marriages is broken. Their children is not doing well. Their businesses are not working. They are without money, without jobs. Their lives fall apart. And you look at these people. I mean, from the heart of God, we want to help them. And I would love to have one button that I can press and you are perfect. And things are working. And it's not working like that because it's step by step that God is restoring you. But when I talk to these people, and they are beautiful creations of God, 
And actually, when you look at any person, you see godly potential in them. Because everyone has godly potential. But we can't work with you with your potential. We need to get you to become that potential. Like he said, you know, you need the vision of where you're going. You know, who I am, whose I am, and what I'm supposed to become, where I must go, and what does, what does God want me to do now? You need to understand something, you know, what is the journey I'm on? You have to see something more than what is visible so that you can get excited about becoming that. Amen? People sit in front of us with their sad stories, and I realize they don't know who they are. Many, of course, had no, no experience with God, no encounter with Jesus. They are just religious, and religion won't get you in heaven, and religion won't fix your life. You need a, a real encounter with the living Jesus Christ to change you, to for, get forgiven, to get all the rubbish out of your life, to become a new person, to be born again. You need a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. There's no way around it. Being religious won't do it. And I've, I, I had enough of that in my own life. I, I was being raised in a religious environment, very religious. We had to go to church, man. When the church did anything, we were there. Wednesday nights, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. In Sunday evenings, it was just, my father was sort of head of the elders, so it was the Dwomni and my dad and the head of the deacons and the organist, what do you call her? And here we were, you know, and, and we were in church every week. And I was sitting there and hope it will get past, you know, and just sleep my way through it. And uh, full of religion. My mom was so religious. There's so many things we, we may not do. I may not do homework on Sundays. I may not cut with the scissors on a Sunday because you would you put it in the eye of Jesus, whatever the stories they had. And um, I mean, uh, you need, Sundays you must rest. And I still don't know why I had to wash the dishes after the meal. <laughs> and... Um, Religion didn't help me, obvious nobody. And uh, when I was 19, the curtains opened up. And I understand, I understood what Jesus did for me, that he hanged on that cross for me. And I gave my life to him so that by giving my life to him, he gave life to me. And my new life, being born again, started. And I was so in love with Jesus. I had his name on everything. I was a student. I was in an electronic world those days, studying electronics on airplanes. And I wrote the name of Jesus on everything that was moving. My little Volkswagen had stickers on of Jesus, you know. My backpack, everything was just Jesus, Jesus. And I was so in love with him because suddenly something opened up in my life of real forgiveness and a new life. And, um, and it took me some years to get to the next step, and that was to receive the Holy Spirit, to be filled, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and actually even after that to start speaking in tongues, operating in gifts. It was so new, so fresh, especially for an Kerk, okay. Because my theological training as a Domini did not teach me that stuff. So I eventually, you can imagine, got in trouble with all my Holy Spirit things and speaking in tongues. And I mean, even in my student days as a NG Kerk, okay, I started to drive out demons, pray for people, and they got healed. Now I was now deep in the trouble. And um, so here I am now. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> but um, one of my greatest experiences eventually in my life years later after I met Jesus after I was filled with Holy Spirit was to get to know Father as my daddy man it was so great it was like a new born again and born again again you know it's like 
I've got a daddy, a father that loves me. And my topic today is, is about identity in God. Find your identity, become the identity of God. Now, I know the word identity has been used often. And I hear in the church world, worldwide, many people are preaching on the topic of identity. And it's great. It's like Holy Spirit has awakened the church to become aware of identity. And, um, and nothing of that is wrong. Uh, some of it I hear is just still too poor. To, it's not the full picture. But we will get there. And, and for me in this journey is to help people to understand their full identity. And I don't think I know everything, but we are growing. But what I've discovered is that most people in church, world churches, pastors preaching, will focus on the identity you have in Jesus. And that's very important. But that's the beginning. Because then you have your identity in the Holy Spirit. And then you need to find your identity in the Father. So the cherry on the cake. I don't know whether that's good English. Um, sorry, I failed English in school, so I'm still trying. Um, the ultimate of my relationship with God is to hear what Jesus heard when he was in the Jordan River. You are my beloved son in whom I have great joy. That's what Father said from heaven to his son Jesus after being baptized. You are my beloved son. You know the greatest need that you and I have is to hear daily Father say to you, you are my beloved son, daughter. You see, that's identity. It's not about knowing it in the book. It's about hearing it yourself. You have to hear him. We call it the encounter with God. And I had many times in my life this experience. Often, I just worship and become quiet in the presence of the Father. I hear the echoes. You are my beloved son. I'm so proud of you. I love you. And even while I know I've just messed up yesterday and I've made some mistakes, he still tell me, you are my beloved son. And you see, God wants to build your identity. And we all have broken identities. We, most of us have false identity. And you have some identity that is bound to your family, to your culture, where you come from. And most probably it's not good. You know, I come out of a staunch Africana background that had some great things in and some bad things in. And I was a fighter for Afrikaners. My mother took me to the graveyards of children that was killed in the concentration camps by the British. And as a little boy, I said, I will kill all the Brits, all the English, for what they've done to our people. And I said, I will never speak English. I actually made a pact, I will never speak English. And you, you realize I had to break that curse that I've put on myself. And also my feelings about English people. I had, I had English neighbors uh, in my school days. And I, as I see them in the street, I will run and hit them. I shot them with a slingshot. <laughs> clay lot. I don't know what you call a clay lot. I, I've, I mean, my, I was in war most of my life because something was wrong in here. And um, so you can imagine when I was 19 and gave my life to Jesus, one of the strong voices of God I heard in that time was, you will preach in English. And I thought, no ways. I only use English for self-defense, you know. <laughs> but God had to heal me. And today, Many of my best friends are English-speaking people. And uh, God has connected me to very a lot of beautiful English people. In my student days, I've been involved with the secret organization of the Bruderbond, where, you know, you built out super Africana culture. And I've, I've been, I mean, I was a fighter in that. As a young student, it's like, uh, you know, you are in war. 
and, and fighting for your culture. And the culture became more important than God for most people, you know, and I loved Afrikaner people, but it's the only culture in the world that has built a monument for themselves down in Cape Town for the language that we are speaking. And our language is only 100 years old, and it's the only language in the world that actually went underground, secret organizations to protect it. Um, so he tells you something about people's wrong priorities. And, um, and God had to deliver me from my identity that was rooted in the wrong things. Now, sorry for people who feel I'm stepping on your toes because you, you or your daddy or opa was brother bonders. Uh, they are lovely people. Most of them are good Christians. Um, it's about what's your identity? Is it rooted in heaven? Is heaven my nationality, you know, my, my life? I'm living from heaven to earth. And I love all cultures. And I love all languages. I love all people. Now, God had to heal me from that. He had to heal me from many other things also. I was raised in a lot of poverty. So going to the, the, the Aswapa, um, rubbish dumps on Saturdays with my bicycle and go through the rubbish of people, that was like my lifestyle. And, uh, and I will collect all the rubbish that people are throwing away and bring it home. Now, I'm not against that, that you can maybe get something useful in it. But I, I developed a scrapyard mentality. I was always after some scrap. And uh, God had to deliver me from that because if I read the Bible, I realize I'm royalty. I'm a son of the king. I'm not a beggar. I'm not a second-hand citizen. I'm royalty. I'm a prince. You are. And therefore, I, I will not surrender to, to be a slave or a beggar. Uh, or, you know, I'm royalty, and therefore I, I live to that standard. Even if it's sometimes difficult, I, that is my mindset. You know, if the new king of England, uh, now called King Charles, if he would come in here with, I mean, he, he would not drive his own car. He would come here with a Rolls Royce Bentley or whatever, and he will not even have a wallet with him because he do not buy things himself. Everything belongs to him. And uh, he knows who he is. You know, he, he, he's being raised in royalty. That's his mindset. So he, he doesn't expect anything less than that wherever he, he goes. Now I want you just I use it as an example because God wants you to realize he has delivered you and paid the price through his son for you to have a mind of royalty. Now, if you have the mind of God, it doesn't mean that you are not serving because great leaders are great servers. I serve, and by serving, I am winning people. That's why Jesus could wash feet and not losing his identity. We are, we are royalty rulers. I mean, all authority in heaven and earth is given to Jesus. And then he washed feet. He didn't need to do that, but that's what, that what, what we do. And I've, I'm, I'm a feet washer. I'm serving people while I know who I am. I've cast out thousands of demons out of people. And my success is not in knowing all the tricks of the trade. My success is in knowing who I am. And I know when I open my mouth to pray, demons are listening and running because I'm praying from the throne room of my daddy. And my authority is in him. And I don't have to make it up. Don't have to repeat praying for someone, in the name of Jesus, you will listen to me, you come out. You know, we use a lot of great words. And maybe you are praying a lot of good prayers, but you're praying it from the wrong place because you are not seated with Jesus. You're not there where you should be spiritually. 
You do the right things from the wrong place. I hope it makes sense. Because I, I want you to understand that, that your calling is to move to the most holy place. In the tabernacle was the courtyard where everyone could come in. Then there was a second room called the holy place. And then the third room, the most holy place. Now the good news was when Jesus died, that curtain came down. And suddenly the most holy place opened up to all of us. In the Old Testament, the high priest could only go in there once a year. And he had to go in there with a lot of preparation. Special clothes, blood being dripped on him. He had to prepare a whole year to enter once into that holy of holies. Just to hear the voice of God and to hear what God says and ask God certain things for the people. Now you are called not to go in there once a day. You are called to live from that place. That becomes your bedroom, your lounge, to be in the Holy of Holies, to become the Ark of the Covenant. And I, I've studied this for many years. And, uh, and there's a lot of great people who influence me. Yonki Cho, biggest church in the world, he's now in heaven. But I've learned a lot from him on this whole topic of the tabernacle. Someone like Ben Heen had a great series on the tabernacle years ago that really blessed me. And then there's many others. And, and as this was growing, I realized, you know, many people don't honor the Old Testament. They think we are people of the New Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. But you know the new is built on the old. The old is a shadow of that what should come. The first church, you know, when, when Jesus came and the first church started with the disciples, the only Bible they had for 300 years was the Old Testament. They preached Jesus out of the Old Testament. They studied the Messiah and the principles of God from the Old Testament. And what we now have as new eventually came together. It took nearly 400 years for that to come together to become what we call today the New Testament. I want you to realize that, that if you ignore the old, you are actually ignoring the foundation of your belief system. And if you understand that, that what is in the new becomes so beautiful. And, you know, the Old Testament has over 300 references about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. And the New Testament have about 300 references back to the Old Testament about things that were said about Jesus. Now, this, this book of mine is actually uh, available here at the foyer um, afterwards, but... Uh, um, Derek Crompton, the father of this house, he wrote in the front, he said, this book should become <clears throat> um, a must read for any Bible school student. And um, coming from him, it has a lot of value. Um, because when I submit the book to him, and he, was, he said, man, the, the content in this is really what our people need to understand where we're coming from and what God wants to restore in his church. Now, three reformations, it says, the, uh, understand the third reformation. What was the first reformation? 500 years ago, Martin Luther, Calvin, the whole first reformation started breaking away from the Roman Catholic deception, lies. And they actually started to preach Jesus and salvation and be born again. So that is 500 years ago only that that what was lost over 2,000 years ago was revived. And the first room of the tabernacle was actually restored. Everything about Jesus. Now, 100 years ago, we had the second reformation called the Pentecostal or Holy Spirit Reformation. When the Holy Spirit, for the first time since 2,000 years ago, fell on people and they start speaking in tongues, prophesy, and start living in the gifts. That's 100 years ago with the Pentecostal revival all through the world, started in Los Angeles and other places. So that was the second revival. So the first one was about Jesus, the second one about Holy Spirit. 
now we are moving to the third room. The third reformation. What is that about? If the first one is Jesus and the second one is Holy Spirit, what is number three? Father. And if you, if you are sensitive enough to see what's happening in the world, in churches, in the movements, and the apostolic movement all over the world, you see God is restoring the role, the place, the centrality of the Father back into the church. Suddenly you get books coming up, you know, about Father. Um, my book that, that is basically finished, I'm waiting for the printers to, to do, finish it, uh, Father, uh, Fatherhood University is my book's name. It's, it's about all restoration, the third reformation for the world, bringing Father back into the picture. You know, the sad thing is most churches are preaching gospel without Father. It's not that they don't believe in the Father. They don't, just don't give any attention to the Father. Why? Because 90% of people on this planet never had a loving Father. People don't know what the Father means. And uh, the intimate relationship with a the daddy, they don't know. You know, and that if, if, if the greatest uh, pain, destruction, um, dysfunction that is on this planet is the absence of fathers. What is God's answer to that? He sent his son to reveal the father. Jesus came, obvious to save us, but his main purpose is to reveal the father to a fatherless planet, earth, generation. Everything is about knowing the Father. For some of you have done my, my course that I did here with your, your Bible school um, and the, the whole thing on in encountering Abba. Um, it's so important, essential, that each one of you need an encounter, experience, intimate confrontation, and a loving embrace from Daddy Father, Abba. Abba means Papa, Daddy. That's why I say that's the cherry on the cake. We can talk a lot of time about baking this cake called your salvation. But if it's not ending with your intimate relationship with Father, you are not there yet. And most Christians are not there. Most Christians don't know Father. And that's actually the reformation that God is bringing in. It may not seem like radical like the first reformation or the second one of the Holy Spirit, but man, this is powerful. We do a lot of healing, inner healing with people, deliverance. The main thing of inner healing, emotional healing, is to get you to Father. Because 99% of people who have broken hearts are broken because of absence of father love. Whether you are alcoholic, you're depressed, suicidal, doesn't matter. Most of that I'll take back to the absence of your father. And if I can heal your mind about a father, I can heal any dysfunction in your life. So there's no sense in driving out some depression out of you or help you to stop drinking. I need to get you back to Father. Because the root of your issues is in not knowing Father. And I need to get the wrong image out and get Father in. And um, that's my life calling. John says that's my life message. And um, maybe it is. All right, now I've lost my notes. Just come back in Jesus' name. So if I talk about identity, uh, what is your identity? If I ask you, who are you? Whose are you? To whom do you belong? You know, questions like that. What am I? What am I doing? 
here on earth? Where am I going here on this planet? If you don't have a vision, you will be continuously depressed. That's the first sign of depressed people. And the clever people tell us 80% of the population are depressed. What's the first reason of depression? Lack of vision. People don't have vision. They don't know where they go. Now, we've counseled many people who are depressed. And uh, they have no vision. They don't have hope for tomorrow. They just look here into the problem. And they live here. Yeah, the problem is eating them up. They don't see there's an outcome. There's a way out. If I say today that your healthy, your healthy identity is based on, first of all, know Jesus intimately, knowing Holy Spirit intimately, knowing the Father intimately. Then you have a, the fullness of God operating in your life. Now, because of my time, I would love to go through the old tabernacle from room one, two, and three, and then show you in every room what your identity is. Because, and I'm going to summarize it very quickly. You know, in the first, first room, if you walk in, by the way, Jesus is the door. He says, I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, and life. Three doors to the Holy of Holies. Uh, you can't get to the Father except through Jesus. He's the way to the Father. Third room is the ultimate of the Father. That's where you are not living to, but you're living from. So you have to get there and live from the presence of Father. It's all about presence, knowing Him. You know, the word presence was foreign to most churches 10 years ago. Now we talk about the presence. Moses said, Lord, if your presence is not going with me, I'm not going anywhere. And suddenly we, we realize Father's presence are more important than anything else in your life. I've discovered traditionally as church, we churches will have a meeting like this and we, we are meeting around a sermon. And it's, it's about we sing a few songs, we listen to a sermon and we go home and eat the pasta for lunch. But in this season of the Third Reformation, we don't come together for a sermon. We come together for the presence of God. And uh, so it's not about a pulpit. And, you know, in the tra traditional churches, they put the big Bible on it uh, because they say the word is the highest authority. That's a half truth. There's some truth in it, but it's not the full truth. Because the word is not the highest authority. You know? The presence of God is the highest authority. And out of the presence, the word flows. We honor the word. We love the word. But there's no sense in having a Bible that we say is the highest authority while there's no presence of God. Then the letter kills and the spirit brings life. Many people are worshiping the letter. And I'm coming out of a traditional reformed theology where there's a lot of worshiping of the letter. And I studied theology for so many years. And coming out of that, there's many things they never taught me. And one of the things was never about the presence of God. Never how to pray effectively. Never how to worship correctly. With maybe 15 years of theology training in my life, I still didn't know how to lead someone to Jesus, how to pray effectively, the basics of life. Theology won't do it. Uh, it's, it's great to have it when you have Holy Spirit, <laughs> but theology won't do the thing without the presence of God. And I'm not against theology. We need good, healthy theology, but we start with the presence of God. Out of the presence, everything flows. And out of the presence, we develop great theology for those who are theologians in this house.
You see, God's greatest desire of all is to live inside of you. It sounds funny, but God's greatest desire is to live inside of you. That's why he calls you a temple of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of scripture that says, I come to make a dwelling inside of you. In the Old Testament, God lived in a tent tabernacle. Moses built that thing. And God said, so that I can be worshipped in that place. So people will come to the tent. It will even be a cloud over the tent. They worship God at the tent, bring their sacrifices. Now God says, no, I'm, I'm taking the physical tent away because I want you to become a living tabernacle, a living. God wants to invade this body. You are a temple. And because this temple must be holy, you have to allow this temple to develop the fullness of God inside. And it's all about you becoming like Jesus. You, you flow with the power of Holy Spirit. You are revealing the Father. All those qualities must manifest in your life. And I don't want to go over your head or miss you in this moment, but I, I want you to, to, to ask yourself the question, my family, my husband, my wife, my children, are they seeing Father in me? If I see how some dads talk to their children, I wonder, man, don't you realize you are supposed to reflect the Father? Your children cannot see God. They can see you. And you're supposed to be a reflection of Father here on earth. And that's a great responsibility. I've raised three sons, and now I've got nine grandchildren, beautiful ones. I've got a lot of spiritual sons and daughters connecting to me and to Tisa that we are helping to, to run this race. And my greatest job is to be like God, the Father to them in everything we say and do. They will call me, I will pray, and I, I'm trying to connect to heaven, pray what is in heaven into their lives. When I embrace them, counsel them, train them, teach them, they must feel, see, smell the Father. And that's my responsibility, it's your responsibility. There's just no way out of that. It's not to be a nice Christian now and then, or to go to church on a Sunday to at least be some kind of good Christian. No, no, it's becoming like God. You are the temple of God, of His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit in you makes you holy. And leads you in a holy life, manifesting Jesus Christ and manifesting the Father. And we can't get away from that. God is more concerned about that, your character, than whatever you are trying to do. It's what you become. It's not the things you are doing. Because if I spend time with you, you might forget what I said, but you will not forget what I am. You see, that's the effect we have on children and people. They will, they will pick up on who you are, and that will have a great effect on their lives. And they will forget maybe a lot of things you said. You are, I am, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's your main identity. Just put your hand, to, hand on your heart, if you know where it is, plus minus. Say with me, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm a sanctuary of God. He dwells within my body. And He desires to fill me up and live through me. Amen? That's so powerful as just one little aspect of your identity. Um, he wants to live in you. So, in the tabernacle, in the first room, the first furniture is a box, sacrifice box, where they slaughtered the animals on. And a lot of blood 
killing animals. So people will bring their animals, um, oxes and uh, lambs and so on. So you bring it, you know, to ask for forgiveness for your sin, for your family. They slaughter it, eat, and they do their rituals. And there's a lot of blood being released. And it's all about this animal is taking your sins upon it and being killed on, on your behalf. Then there was a lamb that we know now as Jesus who became our sacrifice. And the first time when they actually realized it was when they exited Egypt. They had to paint the blood around the doorpost. And then they had to eat this lamb. Obviously, put it on fire first. And that's where Passover started. Peshach in, in Hebrew. Passover means the angel of death passed over because of the blood of the lamb. This first furniture in the tabernacle is about the one who died for you, Jesus. He became the sacrifice. And because of his blood, you are redeemed. You are free. Because of his blood, you can now move into the Holy of Holies. The book of Hebrew actually says that because of the blood, we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. You see, the blood of Jesus paved the way for you from the first door right through the second room into the third room, into the presence. The blood paved the way. In the Old Testament, a high priest could go in only once in, a, in his lifetime and once in a year into that room. And there was the fear that he might die when he goes in. Maybe there's something wrong in his life and then God will just kill him. Now we are not going in once a year or once a week. or We live from that place. Why are you not dying in that place? Because of the blood of the Lamb that made you holy. Not you yourself. You cannot make yourself holy. The Holy Spirit used the power of the blood to prepare you to live in the presence of God permanently. It's a holy affair. It's a, it's a beautiful expression, experience, living in the presence of God under the blood. And I will not die because Father looks at me and he sees his son. He sees the blood. He sees your sins are paid. It's wiped out. You're clean. You're holy because of the son. Now I can live in the holy of holies from the throne room of Father. When Jesus said, you will sit with me on my throne as I am sitting with my Father on his throne in the Revelations. You see, as, as a born again Christian, as one who understand the baptism, that's the second furniture in the first room, is the basin with water. Uh, the water baptism is dying with Jesus and being raised with him. And then the next step is to sit with him in, in a heavenly place. Ephesians 2, where Paul is explaining it, and other scriptures. You've died with him, you've been raised with him, now you're seated with Christ in the right hand of the Father. It's not the right side of the Father, right hand means the strong hand. Sorry for the lefties, right means the strong hand. And uh, you can sit with Jesus in the right hand, the strong hand of the Father, ruling with him today. Just listen this morning to a song, beautiful song. Sing about all the great things that one day will happen when we are in heaven. There will be no tears, no sickness, no disease, no demons. And it's obvious it's true. What about now? Ruling over demons now, ruling over sickness now, having joy, peace, love now. Why wait for heaven? You see, that's, that's the, the traditional mindset, put everything for the future. We say, no, 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 you sit with Jesus now. As you sit on that seat in the spirit, you sit with Jesus in the right hand of the Father. That's your privilege now. So when I pray, I don't pray from, from the first room or outside. I'm praying in the right side or right hand of the Father. That's why demons are listening to me when I pray. That's why I can cast demons out much quicker normally than what others do. Because I'm not sitting there and pray. I stand here with Father, with Jesus. I pray from the right place where I know 
I'm with Jesus in the right hand of the Father. And I'm led by the Spirit to pray the right words, the things. You see, I, I want you to come to a place where you're mature and powerful and that there's great effect in your life. When you open your mouth, things are happening. When you touch someone, something is happening. When you pray and lay hands on someone, something is happening. When you counsel people, man, there's revelation of godly knowledge and wisdom. You see, you cannot afford to just be a normal person giving good ideas to people. That's secular counseling. We need to operate from God's right hand in saying godly things. Why do you think Solomon was seen as the most wisest guy ever in history? Now Jesus took over from him. Now we are doing it with Jesus. But Solomon was so powerful, people from all over the world came to listen to his wisdom. And then God says, you are greater than Solomon. People should come from all over to listen to you because of the wisdom of God in your life. Because Jesus is far greater than Solomon and he's in you. You need to have answers for issues and problems because we call that the wisdom of God. But you will only operate in the wisdom if you know who you are and where you are, where you are seated with Christ. And this is not a mindset thing, it's a lifestyle. I hear many people saying the right things and still live like losers. I want to see your life is actually winning. I love to watch your children because your children is the first manifestation whether you are doing it right or wrong. I watch your marriage. I want to see the dynamics of intimacy and love. Then I know you, you are on the right track, connected to the right love. I mean, we do a lot of marriage counseling and it's so sad. I mean, there's daily, weekly people we try to help that eventually might divorce. But people are so selfish, full of themselves, they mess up every relationship. In the meantime, if we could make it work, and we have uh, nearly 44 years of one of the best marriages in the world. I mean, we have fun, we laugh, we jaw, we have great times together. I can't tell you everything. My children will say, don't tell them. You know, <laughs> We have enjoying we enjoying one another but we are connected to father we connected to what jesus did for us and we are growing together and if we could work through all the difficult times seasons in our lives and overcome it you can do it everyone can do it because jesus made a way and obvious in marriage the difficulty in marriage is it takes two to tango. And um, when one wants to get it to work, the other one not, then it makes nearly impossible. And um, that's always the thing with marriage. You need two people who are sold out to love God, love Jesus, allow Holy Spirit to do a miracle. And um, we love to see that happening. In the second room, there's the golden lampstand, seven flames of the golden lampstand, filled with oil and fire, beautiful fire, representing Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, that actually means the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life, filled with oil, and you are on fire. The Bible talks about you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire. And you know, the second room is all about the Holy Spirit. And God wants to revive and bring you back to this powerful experience with the Holy Spirit, to be on fire. The second furniture in that room is a table with showbread on, they call it. Showbread, it's, it's now not important, the detail of the bread, but bread resembles provision. But this is not about money and, and, and cars and things like that. It might include that. But the most important provision that comes through the Holy Spirit to you is the giftings of the Holy Spirit. 
The fact that you can do things, supernatural things, through gifts that God has given you. It's like that bread on that table. I take the piece of bread of prophecy. I take a piece of bread of healing. I take the giftings of Holy Spirit that actually is giving to you to do the work of your ministry. God will not call you to change this world if he doesn't give you the gifts to do it. It's like I'm telling you, fix my car, strip the engine, you know, and I don't give you tools for a job. God calls you to change this world. In order for you to change it, heal it, you need a lot of gifts. And God put it on the table for you to come and say, thank you, Lord, I take this and I take leadership, I take this one and that. And you have to grow in the fact that God wants to give you a lot of gifts. And you have to understand, that's why my identity in the second room is, I'm so grateful I'm baptized of the Holy Spirit, the fire of God is burning in me, I'm on fire, the zeal of God is with me. You know, and that I was preaching in years ago in a Dutch Reform African church, and the guy afterwards said, I can see you are full of the Spirit because you can't stand still. Um, but it's like that. When the Holy Spirit is coming on you, you, you are just on the go. You want to run. You want to do things. The fire of God is burning. And I want to change the world. And I want to see God operate through me. And every one of you sitting here is not, let's, let's say it in a good way, you are not using what God actually gave to you. To change this world. You may, maybe you use one spanner. While there is a hundred others. There's so many things God is availing to you. On the table. That you don't even know. What God wants to. Work through you. Alright. Moving into the third room. I'm coming in for a landing. This airplane needs to land. My children normally say that, that my dad's airplane is going like this. <laughs> but let's get this one to land. In the third room, two furnitures. The first one used to be in the second room. After the curtain was torn, it moved into the, and that you can read in the book of Hebrews explaining that, that the altar of incense, it's a lot of incense being burned in the presence of God. It's about worship and intercession. And I have a whole long story on that. How real worship and real intercession will usher in revival like never before. Therefore, you need to become a dedicated worshiper with everything that you are. And you need to become an intercessor, a prayer warrior like never before. You can't just pray prayers. You have to be driven by the spirit of intercession to pray in what God wants, to see what God wants to do. So the first furniture is all about giving honor and praying with God. And actually you hear what God says, you pray what he prays. And the last furniture in there, the most beautiful one is the Ark of the Covenant. It's a wooden box, acacia wood covered with gold. With two angels over it. And God said to me, when you learn to live in the Holy of Holies, I will help you to become the box covered with gold. My glory will cover your life. Angels will be around you. And that what is inside the box, three things, manna representing uh, grace, will flow out of your life. The second thing in that box was the two tables of the law. It's, uh, it's not the law. It's like a negative word. The two tables of the law. First one is about how to love God. The second one is how to love our neighbors, the people around us. It's all about perfect love. That's the content second. And the third thing within that box, who can remember? Aaron's staff. What, what was happening with that staff? It was blossoming permanently, blossoms and even fruit on it. Just imagine, here's a piece of wood with life blossoms and fruit on forever. 
You see, that's what the presence of God does. When we live in his presence, you will be fruitful and blossom in a supernatural way. But what does that represent? Why did they put that stuff in that box? Because that happened when leaders rebelled against Moses and Aaron. Korah and a lot of 120 others rebelled against the leadership. And God said to all 12 tribes, put your staff in my presence. The one that will blossom is the one that I've anointed to lead and to, to, to be the, uh, the ones. Obviously, it was Aaron and Moses' staff that blossomed in the presence of God. And then Korah and his 120 leaders, the earth opened up and they all suck into death. You know, God disciplined re rebellion more than any other sin. And I, that doesn't give you permission to do other sin. But in the Bible, you'll see whenever people are in rebellion against God or his leaders, they will far more severely disciplined than any other thing. It's interesting how God deals with rebellion. Now, here in a box is now the symbol of connection to the right leadership. That's a, that's a teaching on its own for all day. How to be connected to godly anointed leadership so that you can operate as an ark of the covenant, a mercy seat, a place of healing, a place where Jesus said when you forgive someone, they will be forgiven. If you don't, they won't. You are the carrier of heaven here on earth with the angels of the gold around you. Of these three things, grace and love and correct leadership in your life. If you dishonor leadership, if you turn your back on what God has given you, you will lose out greatly. And unfortunately, our churches are filled with that. And therefore, maybe you're a visitor here, maybe you understand this, the very high importance to be connected to the leader that carries the oil, that brings heaven down in your life. It's so, so, so important. If you dishonor that, you will be dishonored. So don't get there. So in closing, again, um, God wants to really empower you. And when he says, go and make disciples of all the nations, you do it from that third room, from the presence of God, from the heart of the Father. You cannot go and disciple this nation and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit while you don't have an intimate relationship with Father, with Holy Spirit, or with Jesus. You need to know them or Him. God is one, and we don't have words to explain why God is three. The Bible doesn't give us words to explain it. Theolo theology has a few of words, but it's not even in the Bible. God is one God. We get to know him as the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And he revealed himself to us in that way. In the Old Testament, we get to know God, the Word, Jesus, and the Ruach, the Spirit, hovering over the waters. The, the Trinity of God, we get to know him or them from the beginning. In the New Testament, is more personal. I want to just motivate you not to play games with religion, but to be very close to the heartbeat of the Father. Man, it will take 90% of counseling you need away it will empower your life tremendously just by being close to God. One of my spiritual sons told me the other day, he was just fighting some weakness in his life. And he did it himself. He went to pray and wait on Father. And he said, Father came to me and embraced me and kissed me and hold me. And he told me how much he loved me. And just that one five-minute experience of Father, 
delivered him, counseled him, healed him totally from his weakness he had. So don't wait for a counselor or some people. Spend time with God. Seek him. Wait on Jesus is the way to the Father. And you get into the arms of the Father and he embrace you and he kiss you and he hold you. That's a place we want to live from. So if you feel today you want to get closer to God, you want his identity to manifest in your life like never before and keep it growing, please stand. Obvious, I suppose all of you will stand. If you don't stand, then it's still fine. We love you. On behalf of what he wants to do will might be, if after I've prayed now and you need more prayer, the, the ministers, the, the, the guys who pray for you will lay hands on you and pray for you. So you're welcome to, to come out for personal prayer also. So I'm going to pray for you now and obvious release you. But for those who want more prayer, you are welcome to come, that someone can personally pray for you and lay hands on you and minister to you in a, in a, in a, a deeper way. Is that fine? All right. Father, thank you for these beautiful people. You've called each one of them by name. You know them better than they know themselves. You're closer to them than their, their skins. You want to climb into them that they can feel I'm a temple, I'm a dwelling place of the most holy God. He lives in me. Lord, help us to understand something of this. Help us to, to, to grasp the, the, the beauty of God of the universe wants to live inside of me and calls me a dwelling place of him, a temple. I pray for each one, Lord, for revelation knowledge of the beauty, the mystery of the spirit things. Lord, I, I render powerless any demonic blockage in the minds of people now. Anything the enemy tried to block or steal or stop in understanding or, or having freedom or boldness to come to Father now. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that paved the way into the Holy of Holies that we have boldness and freedom to come to Father even while we are not perfect. And therefore we make this choice now to step into the Holy of Holies to come to our Daddy. I want you to see that, to see yourself because of the blood you step into the presence of Father. It's like that prodigal son who came home and his, that father embraced him and kissed him. Father is standing and waiting for you. And he put his arms around you in the Holy of Holies. He say, welcome. Make this your living room. Make this your room from where you live. And I will be with you forever. I will always be next to you and you will be next to me. Thank you, Father, for the beauty that we can experience this, not as an imagination, but as a reality that we live in the house, in the presence of my Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you made a place for us with the Father, that you take us where you are to sit on the throne with Father. And Lord, anyone in this place who has blockages in their minds about fathers, father wounds, father pain, I pray, Lord, that you take them on a journey of complete healing to deliver them from broken fathers, deliver them from abusive fathers, deliver them from absent fathers. We forgive all our fathers who messed up. We forgive those who have ne never been there or didn't give us love. We forgive the fathers who did not reveal the Father. We forgive them. And we choose now to let go of our earthly father. And I want you to actually see that. You let go of your earthly father. 
you honor him, you can love him, he's still alive, but you're not dependent on him anymore. You let go of your earthly father, and you look up to your heavenly father, who's your real father. Your earthly father was just temporary, short term in your life, but you have a real father, daddy, that you are worth forever. And he's holding you, he's embracing you, He's putting his arms around you. And listen, he's saying, you are my beloved. I love you. And I'm so proud of you. I'm looking forward to run this race with you. And I will help you to make it to the end. Because I'm your daddy. I've made you. And I will finish what I've started with you. Thank you, Father. We appreciate you. Thank you for healing that's spreading over this audience. Healing in hearts, healing of deliverance and freedom coming. Freedom from oppression, freedom from abuse, freedom from pain, emotional pain. Thank you, Lord, for supernatural freedom that comes in this house as you bring freedom to people from any father wounds, even wrong traditional religious mindsets. Deliver us from identities that's not heaven. Our earthly identities, family identity, cultural identity, our pain identity. Deliver us from that, that we can live in the perfect presence of our daddy. You say? If you agree, you can say amen. 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 Thank you.